This afternoon, we get to speak with Kirsti Long, and I'm, I might be pronouncing it incorrectly, but it is a Norwegian pronunciation, so forgive me for that, with her new song, Boys in Jersey, hot off a summer tour ca- called Boys of Summer Tour. How are you, Kirsty? I'm doing good. How are you? I can't complain. You know, we're talking, we're talking about music. We're having a good time. It's been a very hot summer. I don't know uh, if it's been bad where you are, but out here in Southern California, it's uh, it's not doing too well over over here. Yeah, I'm out in Utah, and it's everybody's like, "Oh, it's fall since school started," but it's it's not. It's so hot. <laughs> yeah, it's something that's unexpected for Utah, especially at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're 15 years old. You've been. T- you did your summer tour. It was a. You know, it was about a month long tour that that you did with some select dates. You know, what's it like not only going from regular school to ne- to recording and touring, and then have to be back in geometry class like five weeks later? It's it's really weird. It's like, have you seen Hannah Montana? I've seen a couple episodes. It, it's kind of like that. Okay. Like one second you're on stage, and the next second it's like. I could be doing so much more important things right now than trying to figure out what the square root of X is. <laughs> well, if you decide to become an engineer, or go any into STEM, it's going to be quite helpful. If you're going to sit there and just sing straight into the mic, it might not be the uh, the most exciting thing for you. Yep. Yeah. So you go from from being on stage, singer, songwriter performer to all of a sudden geometry class biology dissections in a few more in a few more months i think that starts up in like november just before thanksgiving you know <laughs> yeah don't worry I, I failed my biology class because of that i threw up on the uh, on the fetal pig oh no the fr- see we had a classroom with two doors and no windows and, and as soon as we opened the bag i threw up all over the fetal pig and i was just like okay this is not for me and uh, one of those old school strict teachers did not pass biology because of it. Ooh, that really sucks. That's a bummer. I definitely would do that too. We just <laughs> dissected crawfish, so that's a little less. That's a, that's a little less, less gut orientated. Yeah. You know, the exoskeleton I think is a little easier. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So tell us about Boys in Jersey. How did the song come about? Is this something that you co-wrote? Was this a song that was presented to you by Warner Media? You know, how did it all come come together? So it's co-written with some of my friends. Their names are Chance and Clayton. Mm-hmm. And we went, we flew out to L.A. to work on it. And we actually brought them a love song. And we were like, here's a love song. Can you help us make it better? And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can totally do that. But what if it wasn't a love song? And so then it just sort of spiraled and I, they were like, okay, well, we can do a love song. What, what do you, who do you like? And I was like, yeah, all the boys in Jersey suck. And then from there it was like, oh, boys in Jersey. That's a, that's a cool title. And then we were like, okay, what type of boys do you not like? And then we just like listed off all the like annoying stereotypes. Mm-hmm. We were like, yeah, let's write a song about stereotypes. And then we, it just sort of happened. And so from all of that, you just wrote an entire song about how much you hate the boys from New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And what has their reaction been to hearing this song? Is there like a badge of honor? Yep, we deserve this. Or yeah, we wear this with pride. Or like, eh, you didn't give us enough credit. So, so far, I don't, pe- I don't think people have noticed that it's a diss song. Okay. I think they take it as a, oh yeah, shout out to the boys in Jersey. She's talking about us. And it's like, yeah, but not in not in a very nice way. <laughs> okay. So. Well, people on the East Coast might still take it as a badge of honor. You never know. You never know, yeah. yeah. So you started performing professionally at 14 years old? Uh, 11. 11 as a professional. Yep. So you got a good four years under your belt at this point. Yes, sir. Yeah. What, what's it like, you know, starting out as something that was something you just enjoyed doing in front of your family that started steamrolling into a career? Well, the thing I love most about performing, like, is the live aspect. Like, you, you can't, like, performing in front of your family, yeah, it's, it's fun, but it's not as cool as, like, getting on stage and, like, headlining a bar or a club or, so... To get to that point, you gotta 
push yourself into the like professional. So I love performing live and I love showing my music and it's kind of hard to do that when you're just performing to your dogs. So. <laughs> Some people don't want to get past performing to the pets. True. You know, let alone the teddy bears. They're like, eh, the, the moving animals is a little too much for them. Yeah, I know. It can be difficult, but it's so much fun. Well, I'm glad for you for that, but you do have to you do have to take me through this uh, remake of Eleanor Rigby from the Beatles uh, from the Beatles in 1966. Okay, that one's that one's a handful. So, have you seen Yesterday? It's a, a movie about the Beatles that came out. Yeah. So, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and my dad was like, "There's a 12 o'clock showing, and we should go and see it." So I was like, "Okay." I'm pretty sure I slept through half the movie, but I was awake for like, it was like a fever dream that movie. And I like get in the car. My dad's like, so after watching the movie, what Beatles song do you want to cover? And the only song I could remember was Eleanor Rigby because the entire movie, like throughout it, he's trying to figure out what the lyrics are. And he's like socks and rice. And he's like trying to figure out what's, and that's all I could remember. And so I was like, let's cover that one. <laughs> And then I like actually looked at the lyrics and I was like, whoa, this is, this is deep. And then the whole like arrangement sort of came to me and I have, I don't have, I don't know if I have it with me, but I have a, like a music sheet and there's like all of this stuff I have it scribbled on, like, and the violin's coming here and the guitar's coming here and the bass picks up here. And I had it all written down and I just kind of handed it to my dad and was like, hey, do you think we could make this happen? And we got together with some amazing, uh, band members out in Nashville and they were like oh yeah easy and it's so cool well just be happy your dad didn't make you watch Yellow Submarine at the midnight showing you'd still be having <laughs> nightmares uh, that is true yeah did you get any reactions from Paul or Ringo you know because I mean th these are some heavy hitters that are still alive and kicking I haven't heard anything from them I don't think they've seen it yet but I hope they see it I hope they're proud of it well, I, I hope so on your behalf, too. Uh, you. you know, you mentioned Hannah Montana, and I, like I said, I saw a couple of episodes. I'm too old for the demographic of the show. But, you know, it, it is this cute, like, she's got to be a regular girl and she's got to be a pop star on top of it. Who are you as a regular person while not performing? And then who is your version of Hannah Montana? Like, the dichotomy between, right. you know, characters. So it's basically the same, except on stage, I actually have fashion taste because people tell me what to wear. And off stage, I look like a homeless person. <laughs> <laughs> so you dress as comfortably as possible off stage. Oh, yeah. Sweats, t-shirts. And then on stage, they're like, here, wear this and wear this. And I'm like, sweet. Now I actually look cool. So Billie then... Eilish took the sweats and t-shirt thing, so I can't do that, but... I think she's dropping it at this point now that she's over 18. So you can incorporate that into your own look. Just go pajamas. Yes. That would be <laughs> so genius. Did the slumber party tour. Yes. <laughs> I'm texting my manager right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you like play soccer? Do you volleyball, any sports or anything to like, you know, because some people use music as an escape, but when you, when your career is music, what's your escape from work? So I love my work, but I do play sports. I play volleyball. My mother is actually the coach. So I'm like the coach's kid that isn't very good, but I get the pity from everybody else because I'm the coach's kid. So <laughs> that's why I sing because I'm no good at sports, but I do play some volleyball and it is a very fun sport. It's okay. Have you ever seen your PR rep play basketball? Melissa's well, no. going to hate me. No, I'm teasing. No, <laughs> Melissa is always posting videos of herself playing basketball. Oh, I've, I've seen a couple of those. She, yeah. My dad plays basketball, and so whenever we meet up with Melissa, yeah. she's always like, 1v1 me, and my dad's like, mm. <laughs> I just I just always tease her about basketball, so now she's going to watch this video and goes, he's saying I suck. What? You know, she's going to be that. <laughs> right. so. This way we have proof that she watched the interview. Right. <laughs> so your dad plays basketball, your mom plays volleyball, you're tired of singing to the dogs. So you kind of have an average life off stage. You're not like rock star sunglasses at night type person. Yeah, no. Yeah. 
your year basic does horseback riding, does high school volleyball, that person. And then I get on stage and it's like, yeah. yeah. Are, are people surprised or do they treat you differently in school because they know that you're a live performer and have gone on tour and then they see you sitting in, you know, English class with them? Um, I've seen it happen a couple of times, but once they get to know me, it's sort of like, oh, she's just your regular, your regular person. So. Because some people always like have that dichotomy of like they, they treat you differently or they're like, oh, she's a rock star. She thinks she's better than us. You know, why? Why is she just gracing us with her presence? You know, the like the bratty, jealous kids. Yeah, I have only seen a couple of those people. Most of the people in my school are very, very nice. And so they just treat me normal, which I enjoy because it, it's a little odd for people to be like looking at you weird when you're walking down the hall with your math book. So. That's your lesson in life. Just carry your math book wherever you go, even after you turn 35. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Don't worry. Adults never change either. They're still the same way. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. you, you will be in 10th grade for the rest of your life, even after you get out of high school. That sounds a little bit rough, but I think I can live with that. <laughs> so at 15 years old, you start performing live at 11 professionally. Like, were you always musical, like, even in your infancy, like, you were humming tunes, you know, your parents tell you stuff like that? Like, when did they notice that you had a musical inclination? And then when did you start realizing that you really enjoyed performing as a musician? Uh, the first story I heard was, we used to live out in Jersey, New York, and we went in and we saw Wicked on Broadway. And when we came home, it was like the middle of the day, and my parents were like, go clean your room. And so I turned on the Wicked soundtrack. I was like six or seven, I think. And I was singing to it and they're in the living room. And they're like, wait a sec. Is she actually hitting those notes? And then from then on, it like, she like showed me to my aunts who are uh, professional actors. And she was like, is, are, is she actually sounding good? And they were like, yeah, this is, this is a thing. And so I started doing lessons and that's sort of where my, my love of music started. All right. And I see you got a small collection of guitars behind you. You got at least five of them there. Yeah. Which one's your favorite of the five? So I don't play the guitar, okay. but I do have a favorite. The one hanging on the wall right there. That is my dad's Gibson. My dad is left-handed, and they don't make a lot of left-handed Gibsons. But from some miracle, he found a left-handed Gibson, and it is literally my favorite thing. I just love the sound, and it looks so much cooler than all the other guitars so that one is for sure my my favorite of my dad's guitar nice and does he play with you or help you like set the melodies and the tones yeah so my dad he helps me song right and whenever there's like a last minute hey we need you to do a show he's like the acoustic band because it's when it's so last minute and you can't get anybody else it's like dad take your guitar let's go so he is my my uh, guitarist, and he also helps me with the songs. He comes up, he comes to me, and he's like, here's this cool little riff I found on the guitar. Does this sound good? And then I'm like, yeah, let's write a song to it. So. Nice. And speaking of Gibson, Debbie Gibson's dad used to help her write songs. So Yeah. Yeah, it all ties in together. The guitars, the performer, <laughs> everything. So It's a huge circle. So who got you starstruck since you performed with so many people and you're still young in your career and you're still young in general? But like every once in a while, some, you get starstruck over somebody. Who has it been that you've either performed with or have gotten to meet that kind of took your breath away? Ooh, that's a good question. So I saw Stevie Nicks live and I didn't get to meet her and I didn't get to perform with her, but just like seeing her on stage and hearing all of the old like Fleetwood Mac songs and all the new ones, I was like, you're so awesome. So she definitely made me awestruck. Um, I've met a lot of really amazing performers that are like, they're just hands down awesome. Where whenever I see them on stage, I'm like, oh, I wish I was you, you're so cool. But I, there's so many of them I can't like, I can't name anyone. Well, maybe you'll get to work with Stevie Nicks at some point. Maybe, I'm hoping. Is there a song of hers that you'd like to remake since you've already done the Beatles? I don't. Okay. Well, it would either be 
Uh, Everywhere by Fleetwood Mac or Rihanna's such a good one, but it's so like so many people have already like covered that one. So I don't know. I have to think about it. But for my my initial thought is Everywhere by Fleetwood Mac. I dig it. Not too many people would go that route. So I like that. Yeah. And now you have your EP out as well. So for people that don't know, EP is an extended play. Uh, it's a mini album. It's what, f- five songs up on it? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, besides obviously, you know, Boys in Jersey, what what are some of the other songs on there that like really strike a chord with it and wanted this arrangement of, of songs in the order that they're placed on the EP? So I don't think it's released yet unless you're talking about the Not Your Princess one. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So it's all Not Your Princess, but there are different types. One's a rock, which was the original. That's how I originally wrote it. And then there's a pop version for people who aren't so into the rock version. And then I think there's like a dance version and like an electronic one. I don't know what we were thinking. It was like the middle of the night. My dad was like, so... We're thinking of just making a bunch of different Not Your Princesses and putting it on me, Pete. And I was like, sure. So if somebody likes dance and they want to listen to like a dance version of Not Your Princess, then they can do that. If they like pop more, they can listen to the pop. So if they like rock. So it's all sorts of all sorts of different types. Yeah. Well, that's fun. Then eventually the EDM version and mariachi versions are coming out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you have fun and that your parents are keeping you grounded. Like, how do they keep you from getting a big ego? Um, it's a good question. Well, I think we step, we like set moral standards, like going into it. We're like, we're not going past these moral standards, which is really helpful for me because it teaches me this is what I want to do with my life and nothing can shake my boundaries, which is good for them. They're good parents. They're, they're solid parents. But yeah. They just gave me very good moral standards and they said, this is how we want you to live your life. How do you want to live your life? Sweet. Stick with that. So. And how do you guys end up from New Jersey over to Utah? So my dad's family is from Utah. So his work kind of moved him over here and it was like, oh, well, family's here. So we might as well go. So now you get to spend time with like aunts and cousins and stuff. Yep. Yeah, and you're not too far from California now, so you get to go to Disneyland instead of Disney World. That is true. Yeah. What What was the greatest transition of going from New Jersey to Utah? Because, you know, they both get kind of cold and snowy. I think the biggest transition was the humidity. Out in Jersey, you walk outside and it's so hot and it's so sticky. But out here, it's just so, like, hot and dry. Like, out in Jersey, I rarely had to drink anything because the, like, humidity was giving me all the moisture. But you walk outside and you're like a piece of parchment paper. You're, like, so dry. So lots of chapstick and lots of hand lotion. That's the biggest, like, I didn't even know these things existed. So. At least you don't have to worry about your hair getting big. That is true. There is a lot less static. And since I have short hair... I don't have like an afro in the morning, which is nice. Yeah, and do you ski out there since so many people ski in Utah? I have a traumatic experience with skiing. <laughs> we, when I was little, we came out to Utah to ski, and my little sister must have been two or three at the time, and my she had little skis on, and my dad was swinging her in between his legs, and I was coming down the mountain, and I didn't know how to steer, and I went right in between my dad's legs, and my sister's skis hit me in the forehead, and ever since then, I was like, nope. Never skiing again. So I haven't since, and I was like five. So I don't know. Maybe I'll try it again. Let's stick to tobogganing at this point. Yeah, yeah. You know? at this point. May, maybe even, you know, what, what's that, uh, those inner tubes that you use to go down the mountain or something? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'll just get one of those inflatable pool tools, and then I'll just like <laughs> slide down the mountain on it. There you go. Just floor. stay on the kitty hill. Be safe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, is there any type of genre that you want to tackle? You know, because when, when it comes to music, a lot of people like to stay genre centric. You know, if they're rock, they want to stay rock. If they're metal, they want to stay metal. If they're hip hop, they want to stay hip hop. They don't like to veer off too much from what people would assume them 
to be artistically. Do you see yourself as fanning out a little more and being able to be different genres depending on your mood? I don't think so. The way that I kind of stick is I've got a wide spectrum, but it's all sort of in the like rock pop genre. So I can either go like way hard pop or like way hard like 90s emo rock. There's like that and this, and there's like a little bit of the in-between, but I I don't think I could do country. I do, when I sing, when I was little, I had like a tang to my voice when I sang. So people were like, oh, you should go into country. And I was like, eh, I'm not sure about that. And I would love to do R&B, but I, I don't know how well I would sit with that. I It's very like, you have to stay behind the beat. And with rock, it's all like, you're on the beat or rushing the beat. And so R&B is like, you got to chillax. And it's a lot harder to sing than some of the other stuff. So I don't know. I might branch out. But so far, I'm going to stay in my my little rock pop genre. All right. So, you know, let me know when you hit the J-pop uh, era. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So your your parents keep you grounded. They keep they keep you you know with this set of moralistic ideology that that fits the tone of the family and and the way you guys have a system of, of belief, um, you know, and that's helped you stay grounded in, in who you are at this point. You know, have people tried to test those boundaries? You know, yeah. And you guys just said, "No, nah, that's not us. See you later." Yeah. Good. That's very rare these days. Yeah, but if you have good moral standards, it's kind of hard to shake them. And also, a lot of problems that my parents are trying to prepare me for, it's like when you get older, people are going to ask you if you want to do cigarettes or if you want And my mom, she was asked that a lot in high school, and her response, she was a professional, not professional, but she did volleyball in college. So she was very, nope, that'll damage my lungs, which will damage my career in volleyball. So no, it was very, this is what I want to do to li- do in life, and I want to do everything that I can to make sure that I can do like everything in my power power to get there. So if you yeah. have strong moral boundaries, it's, it's pretty pretty easy to say, eh, nah. Yeah, I, I side with your mom on the not smoking thing. And also I'm cheap and I'm not willing to spend $10 a pack. So we're good to go. <laughs> yeah. That's an expensive habit. Like I thought shoe collectors had an expensive habit. And then I saw what smokers go through and I'm like, yeah. yeah. You know. My dad is a shoe collector, so. So your I, dad's a sneakerhead. He's got like a bunch of Air Jordans sitting in the closet. Oh yeah, but no, he wears all of them, and it's nuts because he has like a shoe per like every four outfits, and it's like, how did you? Like sometimes I'm like, where do those shoes come from? And he's had them for like years, and I've just never seen them before because he hasn't worn the outfit that correlates with the shoes. So he does have a lot of shoes, but. It's super cool because on stage he'll like whip out some really cool shoes and it's like, oh, okay, that's impressive. And you haven't taken your dad's shoe habit at this point? No, I'm not big on shoes. He actually like has to buy me shoes and like, I think before we went on tour, he told me that he would burn my sneakers if I didn't buy nice ones to wear around at tour. And I was loved my sneakers. So I was like, no, fine, I'll buy it. Like, Nike Air Force Ones. And he was like, good, you better. So so I have my sneakers and now I have a pair of white Air Force Ones, which are which are pretty nice. I, I like them. So what you're saying is your dad took all his guitar money and spent it on shoes? Yeah. <laughs> so then he's a shoe collector. So what are you what are you a collector of? Books. I'm a big book nerd. Do you read them or do you just buy them with the intent to read and then just keep buying more on top of it like most people? I actually read them. I actually run out of books. Like right now I'm rereading the Percy Jackson series for the fourth time, third time, because I've ran out of books and I need to go buy more. So I'm a a big book Noxie. So, you know, there's this magical place called the library where if you actually get a card, you can get them for free for a couple of weeks. And you- what? <laughs> I know. People forget That's about crazy. that place. I know. Uh, People do libraries. forget about that place, though. Yeah. yeah. I get a lot of my books from the library. I just got to remember to return them. Right. Or else then you end up spending $30 on return fees. And you're like, I could have bought four yeah. copies of this thing. 
Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, you might be better off buying your books if you have trouble returning them in a timely fa uh, yeah. fashion. So you're a book collector. Your dad's a shoe collector. Your mom's a volleyball player. You know, what does your little sister do? Play harmonica? My like, little sister, no, she actually contributes to this. Okay. One of, she's got, if you can see it, on the far, far side next to the Gibson, there's a really tiny guitar. Mm -hmm. That's hers, and she has a ukulele next to it, but I don't know if you can see it on Zoom. But she plays the ukulele and the guitar, and she is a softball player and is the social butterfly of the family. So she's the only extrovert. You just get your extroverted behavior on the stage and get it out and then go back to your books. And then your sister just keeps it on. No, it's split like half and half. My dad, my older brother, and my little sister are the extroverts of the family. And then my mom, me, and my little brother are the introverts of the family. Okay, that works. And your little brother or your older brother does what? My older brother is a very good volleyball player. And he's an actor. Nice. You guys yeah. ever think about like doing a musical theater skit together or something? Yeah, actually, we, we we have so many like musicals memorized that when we were little, we would stand in front of the family and I do the singing and he'd do the acting and the rapping. And it's like we did a whole rendition of Hamilton minus the cursing. <laughs> so <laughs> I think my grandma has videos there. It's it's pretty embarrassing. But yeah. Until it gets released and then goes viral. <laughs> so how did you get famous? Well, a video of me and my brother performing Hamilton got out. I, uh, I would uh, be 100% honest. I don't like mu musicals. They terrify me. Really? Like, if it's on stage, I can handle it. But if it's a movie musical, it's terrifying. <laughs> they like absolutely terrify me. phobia of movie musicals? It, it's... Not necessarily a phobia. It's a great discomfort. And that like, like I can suspend disbelief that Chris Helmsworth is the God of thunder right. and goes and visits Zeus and then Zeus shoots him down. Right. I can suspend right. disbelief for that. But the minute they start sing battling at each other, I'm like, no, I check out <laughs> like, that. That's my, that's my line of this is where I have to check out. Yeah. I, I can see that. I, I find them slightly weird, but if the music's good, I'm all for it. Like, the acting can be like, meh, but if the music's good, I'll stay for it. Okay. See, like, if it's in a theater and it's a live stage performance, I can handle it. If it's a movie, though, it, you know, <laughs> just really uncomfortable. Then I have your worst nightmare. Yeah. When we were eight, nine, mm -hmm. my, we got Shrek the Musical, the DVD, mm -hmm. as a Christmas present, I think. And this was like the live action stage one, right? The live action. Okay. Stage. Yeah. And my sister would play it on repeat in the car. So I basically have Shrek the Musical memory. <laughs> it's so bad. But at the same time, it's like entertaining because you're like, what is going on? And you just have to stay to figure out if there's a plot. And then there isn't really a plot. So you're just like, okay. And then we find out next summer your cast is Fiona and the Shrek the <laughs> Musical li live performance in New York. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Since you are a musical fan, is it strange when they do something like Shrek the Musical or Spider-Man the Musical when there's been stuff like Les Mis and then, you know, Phantom of the Opera? I find it, yeah, it's so odd. Have you heard of SpongeBob the Musical? Yeah. Our school did, not our school, our community theater did a rendition of it. I am not sure what the purpose of it was, but it's like our school did Anastasia and then our community theater was doing Spongebob and it was like, um, like there, it's just two different qualities. If you want to go to have like a fun time and to like, just laugh, you go to Spongebob the musical. If you want to like actually gain something from the musical, then you should probably go to like Les Mis or Jane Eyre or something long and boring. <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> you want to be cultured, go, go, go <laughs> see something long and boring. I like that. <laughs> so, so with Boys in Jersey, what are we going to expect from the EP itself and like 
what's the audience reaction that you want from it? So I'm hoping that they have a good time. I feel like music, we, I release it to like help people go through, work through their emotions, to help people, like I want people to like, if it turns on in the car, they turn it up. Or they're like, yeah, I like this song. This song makes me happy. Or if they're having a dark, hard day, they turn on Boys in Jersey. Or if they want to like sit down and cry, they turn on Elna Rigby. Like I want my music to help, help people emotionally. So I'm hoping people like it. And the EP is so, it's going to be so good. We have a new song, a new single coming out that's going to be on the EP. That's, it's killer. And we're recording the music video for it the end of this month. So it's, it's coming soon. I'm super excited for it. It's called Ask Me If I Care. I dig it. Kirstie Lung, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to study for your, ge your geometry test on Thursday. Yep. You know, where can we find you on social media if we want to connect? You can find me at kirstie.long on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And I have a website, kirstielong.com. And make sure everyone spells it the Norwegian way, which is? K-J-E-R-S-T-I. Kirstie Long, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you.